Good afternoon. <clears throat> I had the pleasure of meeting our uh, uh, distinguished speaker uh, before today's luncheon. And uh, when Andy told her that I was going to introduce her, she looked at me and said, don't screw it up. <laughs> and uh, it was a little more direct than that, but uh, as a journalist, I can appreciate uh, that directness. So I'm going st to stick to the script here. It's my pleasure to uh, be here today to support the work of the BGA, our main investigative partner, and of course, Laura Logan and 60 Minutes, as well as CBS. We're all part of one of the news media's most important functions, keeping the public informed despite the challenges we face in unearthing the truth. The way we achieve this, to borrow the BGA's words, Andy often uh, uh, says, is by shining a light on government and holding public officials accountable. Sometimes in the BGA do their watchdog work here in Illinois and in Washington, D.C., while Laura puts her life on the line by investigating governments in foreign countries where it's a life or death struggle, not a political conversation. We watched Laura cover the toppling of Saddam's regime in Iraq, the Arab Spring in the Middle East, and the battle against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in Afghanistan. Her latest story on Afghanistan ran on Sunday to kick off the 45th season of 60 Minutes, and she's here to share her insights with us today. For that, we thank Laura and all of our friends at CBS News. She is a native of South Africa, a mother of two small children. They live in Washington, D.C., and she is, without question, one of the most courageous and intrepid reporters in the world. Please join me in welcoming 60 Minutes correspondent and CBS News Chief Foreign Correspondent, Lara Logan. Thank you very much. Jim is actually being kind. What I said to him was, don't fuck it up, not don't screw it up. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Hello, Chicago. It's very nice to be here. Thank you so much. It's pretty amazing. I know that uh, Andy Shaw is probably the force behind all these tables and all these people that are here. I, I understand that Andy brought the BGA back from death's door, and he did it single-handedly, obviously now with a big team behind him, but it's thanks to all of you. And, and we have, at 60 Minutes, a history with the BGA, and we hope to take that into the future. We hope to be fully exploiting all of your investigators and your hard work and the time you put on the ground here and turning that into 60 Minutes stories and taking all the credit for it. That's, that, uh, that, will, that will take, uh, they'll benefit the relationship as we move into the future. So I learned um, two interesting things in chatting to people in this room before lunch began. One is that I, I suppose I should watch what I say because more than half this room is full of lawyers. And the other is that this town is run by crooks. <laughs> Six out of your last eight governors went to prison? Really? Wow. Which explains why you need a BGA, right? Um, I am very happy to be here. And in fact, the timing was incredibly fortuitous because for the last few years, I have been working on a story that when I first broached the idea, um, everybody looked at me like skeptically, um, even the trusted people around me who have been through a lot with me. And, um, and that was a story about Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan today. It was funny because nobody uh, thought that that was an issue to be paying any attention to and nobody thought there was any real traction to that. And it pissed me off because I knew I wasn't wrong. I had covered that war from the beginning and I had watched what was happening on the battlefield and I have never missed a year of the Afghan war. I've been back every single year. Sometimes I stayed for a year and didn't come home. You know, and, um, and I knew that we were being lied to and I knew that the American people were being misled. And when it comes to issues that I care about, like issues of national security, I don't think that politics um, should dictate your national security policy. And I, I, I don't know a journalist that likes being lied to. So that combination really set us on this path. That and the fact that the challenge of covering a war year after year after year is that how do I, how do I at 60 minutes, I don't live on the ground in Kabul, Afghanistan anymore. I don't have the benefit of that time um, there and being able to develop stories and, and uh, break news. 
So what contribution can I make from afar? And that's when you look at the, at the situation in Afghanistan, you look at the battlefield and you think, what's the smartest story that I can do? Because what's the story that tells people something that really matters? There, there's 100,000 things you can say about Afghanistan and about the war that are all interesting and relevant and important. But there's only one of two or two of them that dictate what it means and where it's taking us and what the consequences are of what we're doing there. And those, that's the way that I try to find my stories. And that led us into this investigation of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. And I, I want to show you just a short clip from the piece that ran on Sunday night um, so that you can have some sense of what I talk about as I move forward. You're in a tough spot right now. Can you explain why the sudden increase in these attacks? Well, I'm mad as hell about them, to be honest with you. Um, we're going to get after this. Uh, it reverberates everywhere across the United States. You know, we're, we're willing to sacrifice a lot for this campaign, but we're not willing to be murdered for it. Training Afghan troops like these Afghan Special Forces soldiers is the centerpiece of General Allen's mission. Once they're there, we're going to move. He's up. already had to suspend training twice because of the rise in insider attacks. I'm not which are threatening America's exit strategy. Should Americans brace themselves for more attacks? Is this going to continue? It will. <clears throat> the enemy recognizes this as a vulnerability. Can you tell Americans what's still at stake in Afghanistan after all these years of war? Terrorism has not gone away. It has increased. When you say that terrorism has increased, what do you mean exactly? If terrorism means violence against civilians, if terrorism means violence against um, our allies, it has increased. It has not abated. It has not gone away. We must then question uh, how come they have returned. Well, that's a good question. How come? How come they have returned? How did that happen? Something must have gone wrong for that to happen. One place where things have gone wrong is in the mountains of Kunar in the east of the country, which has become Al Qaeda's base of operations in Afghanistan today. These are enemy fighters and leaders, filmed there by our Afghan cameramen, who visited a number of different enemy camps. We couldn't go ourselves because it's too dangerous for Westerners to travel on their own to Kuna. They told our cameramen that they work side by side with Al-Qaeda and share their ideology. One Taliban commander agreed to meet with us in the Afghan capital. He's a specialist in suicide bombings, trained by Al-Qaeda. The safest place we could find was the back of a car, and he would only talk if we concealed his identity. As we made our way through the streets, we had to avoid the city's heavy security and keep our cameras hidden from view. Who's behind the insider attacks, what the Americans call insider attacks, infiltrating the Afghan police and army? Is that you? These are Taliban attacks. This is part of our new military strategy. We have our people in the Afghan police and the army, and the orders come from the top. Enemy fighters from the Afghan battlefield have enjoyed freedom and sanctuary on Pakistani soil since the beginning of the war. Your deadliest enemies on the Afghan battlefield have complete freedom of movement inside Pakistan with the blessing of the Pakistanis. And every commander that sat in your shoes has had to try and build a relationship and go through the same motions time and time again. And the effect on the battlefield remains exactly the same. American soldiers continue to die because of the support Pakistan gives to America's enemies. You just stated the truth. That's got to make you mad. Yes, it does. So why did that story matter, and why did we choose to do that particular story? Well, for a number of reasons, but particularly because if Al-Qaeda was truly what drew us to Afghanistan after 9-11, then it was a, we, we felt it was a fair and legitimate question to be asking of American leaders, what is the state of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan? And you would have heard bandied around the number 50 all the time. Every, you know, the, head of the CIA, other people, officials in the administration, love to tell us today that there are only 50 Al-Qaeda left in Afghanistan. And the impression that we're given is that they're one drone strike away from obliteration. And 
that's just simply not true. They know it's not true. And what we had to do was to set about investigating it to discover what was the truth. And we had to be very careful about that because there is a, there is a, a distinction between investigating something to find out what the real situation is and trying to prove something that you believe is true. And those are two very different things and the second one is a very dangerous thing. And it's the enemy of great journalism. And, um, and it's a trap that it's very easy to fall into. And in fact, it was, a, it was my boss, Jeff Fager, who kindly reminded me of that <laughs> at a certain point in the process here. Um, and as usual, he was absolutely right. And we didn't need to prove anything because it was so evident. So how did we set about doing that? Well, of course, we, we turned to the official record. And that meant reading you know, and researching everything that anyone in the administration or a position of authority had had to say about Al Qaeda in Afghanistan over the last few years. Fortunately, I, I read just about everything on a daily basis. So I stay on top of a lot of that. And that is not hard. I think um, having areas, having beats, beat reporters exist for a reason, right? I mean, beat reporting is a great thing because there's nothing like that um, institutional knowledge and that depth of knowledge over time and that gut feeling that you have that tells you when someone's full of shit and when they're not and what you should be concentrating on and what you shouldn't to guide you in doing real true investigative work and so so we not only had to look into all of that but we had to look at every counterterrorism expert in the field we went to the agencies you know obviously to the CIA to wherever we could go we went to the think tanks we went to anyone who was anyone who could possibly know about this. And we kept hearing the same thing time and time again, is that you know, there's no political reason for anybody to be talking to you about this right now. Because if we talk about Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, doesn't that undermine the argument for leaving? And, and that was really a problem for us. At one point, we even had in writing from the US military that Al Qaeda in Afghanistan was off the table, that they weren't even prepared to talk about that, which only made us more determined to talk about it because when you when you're constantly knocked down when people constantly try to bury you and you have the sense that you're onto something you know that it's worthwhile it's it's hard not to doubt yourself and you know that at the end of the day you're going to be standing alone on the 50 yard line in the Super Bowl right I mean you're on the premiere of 60 minutes and you're saying something that nobody in the administration wants to hear and a lot of people in the United States military don't want out there because there were a lot of people who weren't helpful to us in the pursuit of this story. So you better not overstate it. You better know that what you're doing is correct. And you better not screw it up. And you know, the official American position is only one part of that. Just as important to us was what Al Qaeda themselves had to say about this. There's been a narrative coming out of Washington over the last few years, many of it driven by Pakistani lobbying money and um, by Taliban apologists. One of my favorite things to read about is how the Taliban today is so unlike the Taliban of 2001. There are just a more moderate, gentler, kinder Taliban who just can't wait to see women in the workplace occupying you know, an equal role in society and you know, great economic prosperity for all of Afghanistan and don't really want to take us back 3,000 years into that terrible, terrible place that I witnessed in 2001 when I went with the Afghan soldiers who retook Kabul from the Taliban. You know, it's such uh, nonsense. And every now and then you'll read someone in a British paper, or someone in an American paper, someone saying to you that they've been talking to the Taliban and Taliban wanted to go to peace talks and they, they you know, they're, they're ready to renounce their links with Al-Qaeda. There's really the, the theory is if you pack up and go home from Afghanistan, the problem is over. The Taliban just want their country back. They've got no problem with you. And, and we can just, we can stop wasting billions of dollars and, and American lives in Afghanistan. And we can turn our backs on this, um, this war that has really been a waste of our time. That's amazing to me that that's where we are today. Because, I, I mean, not only do I remember the promises that were made, which is fine. You don't want to keep your promises. That's, that's, that's politics, I guess. But <laughs> to think that there's any similarity between this and Vietnam is ridiculous. The Viet Cong didn't care what you did when you went back to America. The Viet Cong weren't fighting for an Islamic caliphate. The Viet Cong didn't have a global struggle. 
And it's amazing to me that we constantly ignore what Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and Haqqani and all these groups tell us every day in their own newspapers, in their own statements. They share something. They share an idea. Al-Qaeda is not an organization. You don't have to have a card, a membership card, or a badge, or something that we recognize in our society. It's something that the FBI can say, okay, I know what that is. I'm going to hold you responsible for what you did in Libya, and we're going to put you on trial in America. This is terrorism. It's a completely and utterly different fight from anything we have faced in our history. And that's why we chose to do this story. Because what's the one thing about Afghanistan that's going to come home to haunt us? What we have done there for the last 11 years, what we, our role in the Middle East, our role across the world, our way of life is under attack. And if you think that's government propaganda, if you think that's nonsense, if you think that's warmongering, you're not listening to what the people who are fighting you say about this fight. In your arrogance, you think you write the script. But you don't. There's two sides, and we don't dictate the terms. And in fact, after 11 years of war in Afghanistan, where we're surrendering, rushing for the exits as fast as we can, not only do we not dictate the terms, but we have less power to dictate anything on the world stage. And we now face an enemy that former US Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who, whose interview didn't make this piece, but we did talk to him, and, and he said, We've killed all the slow and stupid ones. The ones that are left are more committed, and they didn't become any kinder or gentler in the last 11 years. And he's absolutely right. They, another thing Ryan Crocker said was, we think we've won the campaign when they haven't even begun to fight. And that's right. So as a reporter doing investigative work, I chose this subject because, one, I can't, I, I can't stand that there's a major lie being propagated about the real situation. I don't care who's in power. I don't care who's behind it. I'm looking only at, at like I said to General Allen, you can sit here and tell me that you're building a relationship with the Pakistanis. Mm, let me see. General McNeil, the first commanding general in Afghanistan, told me that. So did his replacement, General Barno. General Eikenberry chose not to discuss it and walked out before the interview. General Neal told me that again when he, after his second term in Afghanistan, before he retired. General Schlosser, when he was there. And uh, General Allen, who was so remarkably frank and passionate in his interview that I went there. You know, he was kind of like the invisible general. People don't know a lot about General Allen. But I walked away from that interview thinking if my son was in the United States military in Afghanistan, I would probably want him to have a leader like that because he had the courage of his convictions. And what you didn't see in that story is him at the end saying, um, well, I said to him, I get the feeling, General, this is personal to you. And he said, I didn't, I didn't come here. I came here fully expecting this would be the last job that I ever did. This is completely consuming. I almost can't remember ever having been anywhere else. And what's amazing to me is we, we ask that of people, and we send them to war, and we send people to die. And if anyone has, wants to know what your tax dollars also pay for, because some, we were talking about tax dollars earlier, go and visit Walter Reed sometime, or Bethesda National Medical Center, as it's called. Or take, a, you know, take your family to Arlington Cemetery and see the fresh graves that have been dug that are not, that those soldiers haven't been put in the ground by Hamas and other people on the terrorist list. They've been put there by Al Qaeda and the Taliban and Haqqani and the Pakistani government and all those people who want to destroy the United States, the West, and our way of life. So we tried very hard with this story to, um, to get to the places that are difficult to get to. Al-Qaeda changed the nature of journalism forever when they slit Daniel Pearl's throat on camera. They changed our currency. Journalists no longer had a value in um, reporting things and being witnesses. They became participants in the conflict and in the fight. If Osama bin Laden wanted to get his message out, he didn't need to sit down with 60 Minutes. He had 
any number of jihadi forums, his Al Sahab, his own magazine, and you know Arabic news channels to send his tapes to. And when you go into a situation like the one I was with with that Taliban commander, you always got to think, what's his motivation for talking to me? Because that, in the end, is really going to be the thing that determines whether I walk away from that meeting or I don't, right? Because there's a, obviously a certain amount of risk involved in all of these decisions, but at the end of the day, if you really believe that someone is there for the reasons they say they are, then you've got a chance of coming away from it alive. And in fact, that particular commander I had met before back in 2006 when he was a fighter. And I went and embedded with the Taliban in Ghazni, just south of uh, Kabul. Less than a mile from a US base, I was with like 300 Taliban fighters back in 2006, before we even admitted that the insurgency was back. And I say insurgency like that because the Taliban was a government in power, and they're fighting to get back in power. They don't see themselves as insurgents. It's a very important distinction. And, and for me, if you fail to identify the ideological component to this fight, if you fail to identify what your enemy is really fighting for, if you lie about who they really are, I don't see how you can possibly have the right strategy. And what we wanted to do was to leave people with a sense of something that mattered, something that is going to resonate, something that I honestly believe will come back to haunt us. Um, as it did before, it's almost like Groundhog Day in Afghanistan. That, you know, just as Charlie Wilson's war, right? Charlie Wilson said, <laughs> you know, if you turn your back on Afghanistan now, you're going to pay a price. And we didn't believe them. And then there was 9-11. And when I look at what's happening in Libya, <laughs> there's a, a big song and dance about whether this was a terrorist attack or a protest. And you just want to scream, for God's sake. Are you kidding me? The last time we were attacked like this was the USS Cole, which was a prelude to the 1998 embassy bombings, which was a prelude to 9-11. And you're sending in FBI to investigate. I hope to God that you're sending in your best clandestine warriors who are going to exact revenge and let the world know that the United States will not be attacked on its own soil, that its ambassadors will not be murdered, and the United States will not stand by and do nothing about it. So like every good television reporter, I've completely gone over my time. I would love to take questions because that's my favorite part, but I think we're running late, and I think that's not on the program. I just, I really want to say um, thank you very much. What you do here at the BGA is so important. I, as a South African, witnessed a fight for freedom and justice and equality and all the things that are enshrined in the US Constitution. South Africa's Constitution is based on this one. And I remember my mother complaining shortly after the South African elections about corruption in the government and that kind of thing. And I remember turning to her and saying, what have you done about it, mom? Because <laughs> that's the way a democracy works. If you don't hold your leaders accountable, there is no democracy. Human nature has shown us time and time and time again that left unchecked, people don't fall into the best of themselves. They fall into the worst of themselves. And it's organizations like this that are here to make sure that doesn't happen and to protect the thing that really we go out there every day and fight for. The reason that I do my job is the same reason that Andy runs this organization and the same reason that you are here supporting it. And I just want to say thank you very, very much. And thank you, CBS, for, and my colleagues there for coming here today.